For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, there's an old episode of Seinfeld called The Library, where a man named Lieutenant Bookman makes a visit to Jerry's apartment. And if you've seen the episode, you'll remember that Bookman is the library investigations officer for the New York Public Library. And he shows up to Jerry's apartment to collect fines for a book Jerry allegedly checked out in 1971 and never returned. And the episode ends with Jerry, after being hounded by Bookman throughout the episode, going to the library and grudgingly handing over a check. And this episode hits a little too close to home at our house because a few months ago, we had to pay the local library $50 when we lost a children's paperback book called Apples and Pumpkins. And so we are pretty excited, for one, that there's this growing movement now of libraries in major cities either softening their return policies or completely waiving fines completely. And what do you think happens when libraries stop penalizing people for overdue books? Well, listen to this a few years ago from The Atlantic. When libraries offer popular amnesty periods for returning overdue books, the books often pour in like gushers. An amnesty program in Chicago brought in nearly 20,000 overdue items, Los Angeles nearly 65,000, and San Francisco just shy of 700,000. And a bonus, after the Chicago library went fine free, thousands of users who fe whose fees were forgiven returned to the library for new cards, and readers checked out more books overall than before. And this, friends, begins to get at the logic of the Apostle Paul's words to us in 2 Corinthians this morning. I know some of you are sad. I'm not doing Wisdom of Solomon, which only appears in the lectionary one time in three years. And so we're doing 2 Corinthians. But in 2 Corinthians, here's what we see. The generosity of God leads always to generosity in the church. Gift leads to gift. And so let's look at the what and the why and how of giving in 2 Corinthians. Because turning back to our epistle, we see that Paul is in fundraising mode. It's stewardship season, we might say, and Paul is writing the Corinthians to ask them to give money to the church in Jerusalem, which was struggling because of a famine. And Paul had asked the Corinthians to pledge in the book of 1 Corinthians, and they had agreed to pledge. And so Paul is writing them back now, asking them to make good on their pledge. And we see this in the opening verse where it says, you excel in everything. You excel in faith, you excel in speech, you excel in knowledge, but I want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. And so here's the first thing to notice. It is how matter of fact Paul is about money. We get so squeamish and so uncomfortable, especially in the church, when we begin to talk about money, but for Paul, about half his letters in the New Testament have something to do with this Jerusalem gift. He's always either writing churches to ask them to give or else thanking them for the gifts that they had made. But next, is, it's important to see why Paul asks for their generosity. And really there are two reasons. The first reason he gives is love. He says, I do not say this as a command, but I'm testing the genuineness of your love. He's saying giving to the church is a sign of love. And one of the most tangible ways we know we are growing in love is when we give. When we take advantage of this opportunity God gives us to use us to meet the needs of our brothers and sisters. But the second reason Paul gives is grace. He says... For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor. The generous act. Paul, he's motivating the Corinthians here by reminding them of the Christ gift. When we, who were poor, 
became rich by the riches of God. And what Paul is doing here is highlighting what the New Testament scholar John Barclay calls the incongruity of grace. In his book, Paul and the Gift, Barclay says, you need to understand that in the New Testament, people gave gifts all the time. It was part of their culture, gift giving. But gifts were only thought to be good or perfect if gifts were given to those who were worthy or fitting of them. But in his letters, Paul completely upends and reverses this notion of gift giving by saying that the perfect gift, which is to say the Christ gift, is given precisely to the unworthy. And so for Paul, grace is always incongruous, meaning there's always this gap or this mismatch between the gift and the one who receives it. And so the question for us is, have you received a gift like this? Have you experienced the power of this incongruity? I know you have. I mean, kids, think about a moment in your life when you messed up. I mean, really messed up. And you were convinced your parents would ground you, or they would send you to your room, or you wouldn't be able to leave the house the rest of the summer, or whatever it might be. And then your parents, they didn't punish you at all. They just forgave you, and they said it's okay. Do you remember what that felt like? Or adults, and some of you are married, think back to the first time you met your spouse. And you were convinced that he would be interested in all the other girls in the room besides you. And then he looked at you. Or you thought she would think you were too old or too bald or whatever it might be. But she didn't. <laughs> I got a few laughs. Uh, or maybe, you know, think about this. Um, you thought you weren't smart enough to get into a certain college. But then you got the letter in the mail. Or maybe you thought you would never be experienced or qualified enough to even get a call back from a certain job. But then you got the job. I mean, friends, these are moments of incongruity. They are moments of mismatch. And they are the best moments of our lives. I mean, these are the moments that make us cry in movies. I mean, these are the moments, when these things happen, something washes over us. We feel completely unworthy. We feel the gap. And, and the grace of God that Paul talks about this morning, this grace which, let's be honest, can feel at times really abstract, begins to actually hit home and becomes real for us. And so that is why Paul says to give, incongruity, because Paul knows that people do not return their books until the fines are waived. People are not moved or changed or opened up until they receive grace. And that leads finally to how Paul says to give. Because you notice as you go further in the passage that Paul never gives an amount. He never gives an amount. Instead, he says, I want you to give eagerly. He says, it is appropriate for you not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable. And so how could Paul be so bold? I mean, how could he be so bold not only to ask us to give, but to ask selfish human beings like you and me to give eagerly? How could he be so bold? Because Paul is that confident in the power of grace. The power of incongruity to change us and to change our desires and make us want to do things we never did before. And this is what grace does. When we receive it, it creates reciprocity. It makes us want to give back. It creates a new situation where people who are, have been loved, love. And people who have received, give. I mean, you don't even have to tell them to do it. What does Paul say? I don't give this to you as a command. I'm giving you my advice. 
you don't even have to tell people to do it because they want to do it. They don't do it because they have to, but because they want to. And so what about us? What about our own giving, whether it's giving of our money or giving of our time or our energy? What of our own giving and the moments where we don't want to give? Well, if that's the case, it probably means one of two things have happened. First, we have misunderstood the purpose of giving. And we've gotten to think that God is something like Lieutenant Bookman. And he's come to our house because he wants us to just give over a check. And so we need to give in order to follow the rules and get God off our back and get him to not be mad at us or to get him to bless us. Or we associate giving and charity with some benign idea of being a nice person. I mean, y'all, all those reasons for, for giving are incredibly boring. Otherwise, if we don't want to give, it might mean we're afraid. And we're afraid of running out. We're afraid of running out of money, or running out of energy, or running out of time. You know, economists talk about scarcity. The world runs on scarcity and this fear of there not being enough for me. And so we think, there's only so much to go around. There's only so much money. I only have so much time. I only have so much energy. And so I need to hoard, and I need to hold on to what is mine. And friends, Paul knows this fear of not having enough. And that is why he ends the passage this morning with this quote. He says, as it is written... The one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Do you know what he's quoting here? He's quoting from Exodus 16, when God rained the gift of manna down on Israel. And do you remember what happened? Israel got afraid, and they started hoarding the gift of manna because, like us, they were afraid of running out. But friends, as Christians, Paul wants us to know we will never run out. And we will never run out because God never runs out. The one who had much did not have too much. And the one who had little did not have too little. And that reminds me of another children's book. And since our children are in the service this morning for summer worship, I'm going to read this children's book to us to close. And this is a book called The Doorbell Rang. Kids, have any of you ever read this book? It's from the 80s, so maybe not. But it's by a woman named Pat Hutchins. And here's the situation. You have these two kids named Victoria and Sam, and their mom has just baked them a batch of cookies. But then all of their friends start coming over. So let's see what happens. I've made some cookies for tea, said Ma. Good, said Victoria and Sam. We're starving. Share them between yourselves, said Ma. I made plenty. That's six each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as your grandma's, said Victoria, and they smell as good as grandma's, said Sam. No one makes cookies like grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Tom and Hannah from next door. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That's three each, said Sam and Victoria. They smell as good as your grandma, said Tom, and look as good, said Hannah. No one makes cookies like grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Peter and his little brother. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That's two each, said Victoria and Sam. They look as good as your grandma, said Peter, and smell as good. Nobody makes cookies like grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. It was Joy and Simon and their four cousins. (laughs) The cousins, too? Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. That's one each, said Sam and Victoria. They smell as good as your grandma, said Joy, and look as good, said Simon. No one makes cookies like grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang and rang. Oh, dear, said Ma, as the children stared at the cookies on their plates. Perhaps you'd better eat them before we open the door. We'll wait, said Sam. It was Grandma with an enormous tray of cookies. How nice to have so many friends to share them with, said Grandma. It's a good thing I made a lot. 
Friends, it's a good thing God made a lot. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.